Yeah. So, um, is there a specific reason that you're videotaping this? It's a public meeting. Yes, it is. Yes. Now the statutory right to record it. Okay. I'm sorry. And I didn't catch your name, sir. Kyle Jocelyn. Kyle Jocelyn? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm presenting your First Amendment auditor, is that correct? Not at all. Okay. All right. Did you uh, notify anybody here at the academy that you intended on coming to videotape this? I don't have to. It's a statutory right. Okay. I'm not saying it's not, sir. I'm not saying it's not. Okay. Can I go finish setting up my equipment, please? Yeah, if you'll just give me a moment. Okay. Check it out. I've already done it. I got enough battery. How long do these things usually last? Well, sorry, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Depends on how many. Depends on how many cops have to plead their case. Sir? Depends on how many cops have to plead their case. Yeah, well, that is true. Yes. This is 
Thompson, you go first. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman, you just want to have a seat up there? And we will next, uh, I will look to approve the agenda for today's meeting. I'll entertain a motion. Chief moves adoption of the agenda is submitted. Uh, motion to adopt the agenda is submitted. Do I have a second? Got a second. Uh, any questions, any amendments that we need to make to the agenda for today? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the agenda as presented to you by saying aye. 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 Any opposed like side? Guys, no. Next, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the July 20th, uh, 2022 meeting. I hope everybody's had an opportunity to review those minutes. I'll entertain a motion. The Chief moved adoption of the minutes of the committee. Minutes I got a, a motion to adopt the minutes as presented from the July 2022 meeting. Uh, do I have a second? Got a second, Director Wood. Uh, is there any further discussion with regards to the minutes, any corrections, amendments that we need to make to the minutes that are presented? Any amendments? Hearing none, again, all in favor of approving the minutes that are presented from the July 2022 meeting, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, like, sign? The ayes have it. 
Uh, we'll get right into the general counsel uh, report, the uh, draft report, general counsel, and certification issues. Chief, you can please please announce the first case, Air Force Health, the 2021 CJA 0903. For strong complete funding, this is an allegation of crime against Mr. Felton. Mr. Austin is here on behalf of the agency. Mr. Hicks is here on behalf of the officer. The uh, hearing officer recommended the agency that this was a failure to prosecute. Order of the contested case file, no matter be closed, all documentation pertains to the allegations be exposed. Okay. Uh, and Ms. Uh, okay, you want to go first, Ms. Hicks? Go ahead. It doesn't make a difference, Chief. I'll be glad to, or if you'd like to hear from Ms. Austin first, either way. Um, uh, you go ahead. Chief, I appreciate it. Good morning, members of council. Good morning. Um, I'll try to be uh, somewhat brief on this one. Um, as Mr. Pinnell pointed out, um, this is a failure to prosecute. This matter is currently in default, I believe. I'm sure you've all seen the recommendation um, from hearing officer Young. Um, at the time of this hearing on February the 10th, uh, North Charleston failed to appear. Um, had put in the record, Mr. Brumlow, um, during the pendency where we're waiting, tried to contact him by telephone. They didn't answer, um, so Mr. Young did what the regs said he should do. We put him in uh, default uh, for 37-10, I believe it's six or seven. Um, issues recommendation um, are common. Receiving the recommendation, um, North Charleston sought to submit a uh, opposition of sorts. Granted, it was via email. Um, that was submitted on March 25th, 2022. I don't know if you'll have that or not. It has to be put in writing. Um, North Charleston asked that their email stand. Um, I think a couple things on that, to the extent you've seen it, I, I don't think it can be considered here. Um, it'd be the submission of, of evidence after the close of the case, number one. But per the regulation, once they were put in default, they're not allowed to present evidence anyways. Um, 37-106. So it would run afoul both of the record being closed, but also they were in default. Um, so I, I believe that should be ignored. I don't believe there's any way around it. Um, nonetheless, we did provide a, a reply to that in writing um, at Mr. Brumlow's re request. Um, I believe you should have that. And I think um, two things to be considered here. Um, I've got some concern that the North Charleston may try to stand up here in a few minutes and try to argue this case on the merits. Um, and, and I'd caution, or, or certainly uh, you can seek legal advice if you don't want to listen to me. I don't believe you can do that today. It's in default. Um, at best, the only thing that this could be done is sent back to the hearing officer for, for evidence to be um, heard by the hearing officer. I don't believe we can hear evidence today, um, certainly not on the facts. The uh, PCS form was not made part of this record. Um, all that was made part of the record were the confirmations that North Charleston was served. Um, so it's, number one is I don't even think we can we hear evidence today, but even more than that, I don't believe we can send this back down. Um, the, the default reg 37106 uh, says that you waive your right to introduce evidence, and this is not like, this, this reg and this uh, is not like the statute governing the the timeliness requirement on submitting a PCS form, which says that if it's laid under extenuating circumstances, this council can still hear it. That's absent in 37106. So they failed to prosecute, they're in default. And even more than that, if, if we're gonna allow entities to not appear, tie these gentlemen up or these women up for months on end about their certification, and they come in and say, well, we're gonna let them out of default, and we're gonna hear this anyways, then we've rendered that whole regulation that was put in place moot. Um, so I think it's twofold. I, I don't think we can hear any evidence today. Um, I think at best you could send this back down, but I don't even think you can send it back down because I don't think that the statutes, the regs um, allow for it. And I think the whole purpose behind 37106 is that if, if they fail to appear, no different than if an officer fails to appear at the contested case hearing that, that he requested, he or she requested, they waive. They waive. Um, so all in all, um, we ask that you, you take into consideration what the hearing officer um, found in the recommendation that you, you recognize how this thing played out. And the last thing I would note, um, just to be sure, is, is that there's an argument that, that they were not on notice of being served. Um, I'll direct you to the exhibit 
in the recommendation, which was the certificate of service slip um, for the original notice of hearing. It was signed by a gentleman by the name of Kevin, I may pronounce this wrong, Chines, C-H-I-N-N-E-S. He's who signed that hearing officer made it an exhibit. Um, and I just want to note that when the recommendation was sent to North Charleston, um, the hearing officer's recommendation, when it was served via certified mail to North Charleston, it was also cert signed by the same individual, Kevin Chines. I made that an exhibit. He signed for the recommendation on 3-3-2022. Um, so it's questionable how it wouldn't have been sufficient service for the purposes of the notice of hearing, but the same gentleman signed the hearing officer's report recommendation, and now they're full steam ahead and want to, want to argue that. But other than that, I don't have anything further unless anybody in the council has a question. Anybody in council have any questions at this time? Ms. Dick? Ms. Dick, thank you. We'll, uh, one place, if anybody has a question, we'll call you back up. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Olson, Representative North Charleston. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I wish I would have been in here looking at myself because it's a little bit awkward, but um yeah so i've done a, a ton of these cases i've never not shown up i can go into what happened we scheduled the case has been rescheduled i don't even, i mean countless times four or five times at least we always show up i i would venture to say some of you would prefer that i not show up at the academy as much as i do um but it is not historically something that we've ever done we have been ready to go on this case. We have been told, you know, just bring our stuff up initially. Um, I have scheduled with the report. I mean, there's always a million emails. You have to sign this form. There's a process and I know it and I've done it and it's the same thing every time. Well, this gets rescheduled, rescheduled. Then they pull it and say, no, they don't want a contested hearing. Well, then did Kevin sign it? Yes. Kevin is our guy in the mail room and he signed for service. Did I get it? No. Had I gotten it, I would have been there. So you can do whatever you want with that aspect. I mean, it's this is up to y'all. Um, I didn't get it. We didn't show up. I felt very home cooked. I never got an email. They called my work phone. I never got a voicemail. Granted, my voicemail is full a lot, so that could have been the issue there. But I know all these people, everyone has my cell phone. Like, I didn't get an email. I mean, my emails come up on my phone. It, I mean, the, I don't feel, I didn't feel like that we were given a fair shot when, you know, all of the normal procedures didn't occur. I mean, the form that says that we have a duty to prosecute that we get every time we report misconduct, we didn't get a new one after we pulled the initial um, request for a contested hearing. So there's that problem. The bigger problem though is this upsets me because if this guy gets off on a technicality, like that's not on us. We have provided the information to you. It is appalling to me. I've listened to the audio. I'm not gonna go into the merits of the case because frankly, it's embarrassing and uncomfortable and I don't wanna do it. Um, and the merits, are so bad to where this is the only possible way, in my mind, that this officer could get his certification back. So I would just say that, you know, the city of North Charleston, we investigated it, we did our due, bil did our due diligence, we reported it to you, we fired him. He's not coming back to the city of North Charleston, and that's our only jurisdiction. I mean, that's our only jurisdiction. We can't do anything more. But it's up to y'all as to whether you want police officers getting off on technicalities or whether you want to ensure that the best officers are on protecting our citizens. So that's all I have to say. If you have any questions, I am happy to answer anything. Um, and however y'all want to handle it, um, it's up to you. But the city of North Charleston does not feel like um, Beckles should be uh, allowed to police in the state. But again, that's your decision, not ours. Anybody have any questions, Ms. Long? Okay. Great. Ms. Austin, um, 
I think we all recognize this is a very regrettable Sorry, set of sorry. circumstances and you've uh, indicated you all investigated uh, the officer's behavior. I'm curious, um, have you investigated with equal fervor um, the, the, the ball being dropped from Dean Cerner and you're not getting noticed and, and, and ultimately resulting in, in North Charleston not showing up to prosecute on February 10th of this year. So have you investigated that? Is there anything you can share with I mean, now? there's not much to investigate. I mean, the mail guy signed for it. I was out of the country. I actually got <laughs> stuck. I mean, it was actually pretty awesome. But I got stuck out of the country because I tested positive for COVID with my husband and we were able to send my kids back with my parents. So that was, that was awesome. But I was out of the country like from I think I got back on like January 10th maybe and this and if I'm remembering correctly he signed for maybe January 3rd or 4th I mean I have to look back but we look back on it and uh oh okay I mean I had no intention we were all ready so I mean I think you really need to look at what's the point of these hearings is it you know the point of these hearings Ms. Austin is for they to show up prosecute these cases and for you to think that you can stand there and you can just tell everybody that hey it's not on us now it's on this council you're incorrect well it's with all due respect i mean with all due respect that is our position that is our position if you had shown up to prosecute this case as other agencies show up to prosecute this case we wouldn't be having this discussion right now but okay. the fact that you can stand up there and absolve yourself in North Charleston of any responsibility. That's exactly what I'm doing. happened by this council, you are incorrect. Well, I respectfully disagree with you. We don't so have you any authority over your agency. Well, it's not very respectful to interrupt the chair when he's talking. Okay. I don't have anything else to say. Chair, boss, you have a point? Thank you, Chief. You have a question that could have come directly from anywhere or from Dale. The, uh, was the proper procedure for these matters followed as you would do with any agency in South Carolina? Jimmy, thank you. The, what we do with these cases is when we consider a first time um, so an agency, or excuse me, officer first request the hearing, the notice goes out, but once we make contact with all the parties, then all the follow-up communication from that point forward is GAP. In this case, there was a first contact, but the hearing request was withdrawn, so we start the process over again, and by doing that, then it went out to be a bail. That's how the process works internally works sure. So my question is do you follow did you follow in this instance the same way you do with anybody else? Would it be like the uh function of the police department or somebody like that? Yeah, I, I believe the only thing that was not sent this time was the agency acknowledged our prosecution for that I do not believe was sent the second time around, but the hearing notice itself but the notifications were sent out. Yes. May I, may I make a um, point with that? Again, I've done these so many times, and we email back and forth with the, with the court reporter and what works and schedules and how to do, you know, submit the evidence, make sure things, you know, in the last two years was, are we on Zoom, are we in person? And every hearing I've done is a slew of emails back and forth. And every other situation besides this one hearing, there have been a slew of emails back and forth. I didn't receive one email with this date. This is set in Now they might say, oh, that's how we treat everyone. Fine. But I'm telling you, I didn't receive one email. I would have been here. This is not, I didn't drop the ball. I did not get noticed. And again, I, I mean, there is nothing I can do about that. If you want to look into the case, which I suggest you do because this is bad. Do it. If you don't, don't. I mean, it's it's nothing that we can control. Anybody have any other questions? 
Sheriff Foster, member of the Train Council. I'm Adam Woodsett, General Counsel of SLEG, here asking that you overturn the decision of the hearing officer in this matter. Quite frankly, we feel that the hearing officer missed the mark in virtually every respect in this case. We believe the substantial evidence submitted established that Ryan Park committed misconduct when he intentionally lied and provided deceptive and false statements to a Richland County Sheriff's Department Sergeant Michael Larita during the course of a formal criminal investigation. This whole investigation arose out of a dispute that Mr. Hart had with an individual that was building a house for Mr. Hart, an individual named Marty White. And I'm gonna open my presentation today with a portion of Mr. Hart's words to SLED investigators, because I feel that these words show the mindset and set the stage for evaluating the conduct and the intent during this entire situation. So I'm gonna quote Mr. Hart directly. On Friday, July the 30th, I was advised of an internal investigation being conducted of me from a complaint made against me by Sheriff Lott. This is my true and accurate statement made in defense and denial of the false, outlandish, and unhinged accusations and allegations made against me by the Sheriff. Assertions that are merely a regurgitation of an insane claim made by a mentally unstable individual. These accusations are based on speculation imagination and the false statements of one individual, Gary Martin, Marty White Jr., who is a proven liar and manipulator, not from fact. He is the only one in this matter that's been untruthful and unfortunately has duped the sheriff into questioning me and my integrity in the process. Marty White has stolen from me, cost my family tens of thousands of unnecessary dollars and measurable amounts of mental and emotional distress, wasted two years of my family's time, has attempted to defame me, uh, defame mine and my wife's character to anyone who will listen, and is now attempting to cause irreparable damage to my career, livelihood, and ability to provide for my family. That's a direct quote from Mr. Harp's statement to SLED investigators. So clearly, Mr. Harp had an incredible animosity towards Marty White. Harp believes that he stole from him, cost him and his family money, and wronged his family. So we have that in the back of our mind. Mr. Hart believes that White has wronged him, and I submit he feels that he, he owes him, cost him money, 
and all of this. And this is the mindset that we're working through. And I think this mindset ultimately reveals the true intent behind the words and actions that we'll see presented in this case. So let's back up just a little bit and talk about how the investigation ultimately came to be. During the construction of the house, obviously there was cabinets delivered and cabinets that were gonna be installed in Mr. Hart's house. And some of these were Mr. Hart's cabinets and were installed. Now, some of what were to be Mr. Hart's cabinets were not installed. There were at least two that remained in Mr. White's possession. And as it turns out, there were some other cabinets for another family that were accidentally dropped off at the job site. These were labeled the Jones cabinets and actually were going to the Jones family. The evidence established they were the wrong color and simply didn't fit anywhere in the house. So Mr. White has two of Mr. Hart's cabinets that Mr. Hart says he paid for, and there are some Jones cabinets belonging to someone else that were in the house. However, when Mr. White went to retrieve these cabinets, the Jones cabinets were gone. And notably, only the Jones cabinets had been moved from inside Hart's house. When Mr. White was unable to locate the cabinets, he contacted Richland County and made a complaint because of the missing cabinets. This is how far that building relationship had deteriorated at this point. Mr. Harks believes that, that Mr. White had stolen from him and cost him thousands of dollars and wasted two years of the time, and Mr. White calling law enforcement to report some cabinets missing from the house. So ultimately, Richland County opened an investigation, and the matter was handled by Richland County Sergeant Michael Loria. And I believe that if you look at the conduct, we'll read a sense of what was going on here. We've got a possible civil dispute between a homeowner and a contractor, something that can hopefully get worked out. And so Sergeant Loretta contacted Mr. Hart by telephone to discuss the matter, to try to get it resolved. And this conversation is covered on, on pages six and seven of, of exhibit one, so you can reference it directly if you want to. But I wanna walk through each part of this conversation because it's incredibly important. Now make no mistake, this was an official law enforcement call and an official law enforcement investigation. There was no mistake on that. So Sergeant Loretta says to, to Mr. Hart, the builder is saying that there were some cabinets that were meant for another house and believes he may have taken the cabinets from there. Mr. Hart's response is, uh, I don't know anything about anyone else's cabinets in my house. Doesn't really the answer to the question, but Sergeant Loretta moves on. Did you go over there by chance and take some cabinets thinking they were yours or something like that? Hart's response, as far as I know, everything in that house belongs to me. Again, doesn't really answer the question. And Sergeant Loretta goes, I understand that, but these would have had some people's names on them. Did you go over there and take some cabinets? Now, does Mr. Hart acknowledge that stuff routinely got moved around the construction site? Does he, does he acknowledge that some, some boxes were moved and placed into a trailer? No, he does not. What he says is, I mean, I haven't taken anything from my house. Mr. Counsel, this was, I submit the statement was a flat out lie. This was untrue. And the next unprompted statement really reveals the mindset that we're talking about here and the backdrop and the complete falsity of this statement. Mr. Hart then goes into, I'm supposed to meet with him tomorrow. So maybe if there's something going on, you know, we can talk about it, figure it out. And if he can provide me with, I guess, my cabinets that he still doesn't have at my house yet that I paid for. Now we get to the heart of it. First, it's, it's not really answering the questions. It's I don't know anything. Now it's, if he gives me my cabinets that I paid for, we can figure it out. Remember, this is an individual who Mr. Hart believes has stolen from him, has wronged him and his family for years, and his tune changes from I don't know anything to if he gives me my cabinets that I paid for, we can figure it out. Members of the council, give me a break. It's no mystery why only the Jones cabinets were moved. This was leverage in their dispute clear as day. It's just too convenient that your next statement after I haven't taken anything, moved anything from my house, goes right into, well, if I get my cabinets that I paid for, we can figure it out. And interestingly, Sergeant Loretta kind of 
see what's going on here. His next statement was, I understand, but if there are other people's cabinets that belong that, that they belong to and you're holding them, that's not exactly legal. Our response is, yeah, I don't have anything, any information about anyone else's cabinets. So he's filing a report saying he believes somebody had taken something from my house that belonged to him. Sergeant Reader's response, yeah, apparently there were some cabinets delivered to your house that belonged to another job site. They were delivered there by accident. Now they're missing from your job site. Arch response, I got ya. Um, I mean, I don't know. Well, I guess we'll get a new case number for it and have a deputy come over and do a report for actual property of mine that the builder has given away. Again, says, I know nothing, but if we need a deputy out and we can deal with actual property of mine that's been given away, we'll figure it out. So again, unpack this whole conversation. I know nothing. I know nothing. It's a flat out line. I haven't taken anything from my house and then conveniently moving to give and give me my cabinets that I paid for, we'll figure it out. That I submit members of the council reveals intention, the intentional deception at play here. The misleading comment to a law enforcement officer to a, during an ongoing law enforcement investigation. Submit these were not a mistake. They were a calculated response. The contractor had wronged Mr. Harp, had stolen from him, had affected his family, so Mr. Harp was going to get it figured out. And he needed that leverage to get his cabinets that he paid for and to get something for the property that the builder, his property that the builder gave away. Now let's also compare Mr. Harp's statements to Sergeant Marita to his statement to SLED. To SLED, he acknowledged, I regularly move things around the construction site and I relocated some boxes on the property to a locked and closed tra trailer in the driveway. Things were moved around to make space for the painter that was scheduled to return to work after having issues from the builder. So the law enforcement, during an official investigation, I haven't moved anything from my house. To SLED, he acknowledges the truth. Things were regularly moved around the construction site, and the boxes were moved to accommodate the painter. And again, it's worth noting, no other cabinets were removed from the house, only the Jones cabinets. Now let's also contrast the statement I read earlier from, from Mr. Harp to his testimony at the hearing, specifically on page 93 of the transcript, starting on line 16. Mr. Harp indicated that, that he, referring to Marty White, refused to meet. And this is where I guess our feud that he claims comes from. And I'll be honest, that statement really kind of surprised me given what his statement to the flood investigator was. So I asked him about it, whether there was in fact a dispute between him. And here's his response. I did not have any feud as to whoever's understanding of a feud is. But there was a dispute, excuse me, would be, it wasn't ever, I guess, talked about between him and I. And that's the problem we have throughout this entire situation. Mr. Hart just simply refuses to tell the honest, or whole, and complete truth. Submit he was evasive throughout this entire matter and was playing an angle throughout this entire matter. He wanted leverage in the dispute and was willing to lie to law enforcement to get his way. He blasts Mr. White in a statement saying he stole from him, gave away my property, cost me and my family, put us through two years of delays and mental anguish. I don't know what dispute you're talking about. I don't even know what a feud is. Ridiculous. Now the hearing officer found Mr. Harp to be credible, but she ultimately did not allow the body camera to be played in full at the hearing. And I believe this was error. I believe the video is proper impeachment evidence, shows the lack of credibility and candor this matter. And I would submit if you watch this video beginning at the 8.30 mark, you'll see the level of candor and credibility that we're dealing with. At the end of the day, Mr. Harp said during an official law enforcement investigation, I didn't take anything from my house. Knowing in fact that he absolutely had moved the Jones cabinets and only the Jones cabinets outside of the house and put them in a locked trailer to make room for the painter. And knowing full well where they were, that's how we can say, if he gives me my property that I paid for, we'll figure this out. Sergeant Lorita figured it out. He saw through the deceit 
And I submit that's why Richmond County initiated the complaint, not some unfounded animosity, not because they were duped or anything like that, because they saw this for what it was, intentional deception. So I'm asking the training council to do what the hearing officer did not, see through the deception. This was not a mistake. Again, you got the facts right. Hardy White wronged Mr. Hart. Mr. Hart was gonna get him back for the time, the money, and the mental anguish that Mr. Harp and his family were put through. Unfortunately for Mr. Harp, Richland County investigator got involved and the animosity resulted in intentional deception and false statements to a law enforcement officer during a law enforcement investigation. Members of the training council, I don't have to tell you how important integrity is in law enforcement. Our state and federal constitution, our system of justice demands no less than the complete truth from our law enforcement officers. I submit the evidence in this matter is clear Mr. Hart's intentional deception and false statements to law enforcement officer in the course of an official investigation amount to misconduct in South Carolina. Accordingly, I would ask that you overturn the hearing officer's recommended recommendation and impose the appropriate sanction in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ridley. Does the council have any questions at this time for Mr. Ridley? Thanks, Chairman. This is Brian Stone. I have a quick question. Can you repeat? So there are two sets of cabinets in the house, one for him, one for Jim, and only the Jim's cabinets were moved to the trailer. Is that correct? That's correct. He didn't move himself, right? I believe that's correct. Okay. And who owned that trailer? I was unclear on that. It was Mr. Hart's trailer sitting in Mr. Hart's driveway. I don't have any more questions. From the chair, I just want to verify what I just heard. The trailer where the cabinets were moved, it's Mr. Hart's trailer? That's correct, Sheriff Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitten. Any other questions? Okay. I apologize. I did not get the name of the other council, but please approach and make your presentation. I apologize for not catching your name. It's a delay in this system. Thank you. No problem, Sheriff Foster. Nick Riley with the Moore Bradley Myers Law Firm on behalf of Mr. Hart. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. At the outset, I question the timeliness of the appeal submitted by SLED in this matter. We both agreed to receive the findings of the hearing officer by certified mail. According to the records in my office and according to the certified mail receipt, we received that document, the findings of the hearing officer, on May 25th, 2022. Fifteen working days from that date would be June 15th. We all know that by Section 23-23-150, appeals must be submitted within 15 working days of receipt of the hearing officer's decision. According to my calculations, SLED would have needed to submit those findings, I mean, submit their appeal if they received their finding on the same day that I did by June 15th. It was submitted June 22nd. So by calculation, SLED would have had to have received that document a week after the findings a week after I did. Now, I have no way of knowing when SLED received their documents, so I'm not accusing them of being late. I'm merely questioning them because based upon the timeline that I have, it seems questionable whether it was submitted timely. I would like for the panel to inquire into that matter before issuing a ruling. My opposing counsel did a great job of sort of relitigating this case in his argument. He's asserted essentially that my client intentionally misrepresented investigators as part of the investigation in this matter. As I can tell, the facts of allegations of misconduct all deal with a June 30th telephone call to my client from investigators regarding these cabinets. 
it is clear from the record and undisputed that there was two sets of cabinets in this house at issue, the house owned by my client. The documents and exhibits submitted at the hearing contain a photo of the Jones cabinets. I think it's important to inspect that photo. These are cabinets that are not assembled. They don't have an owner's name listed on them. They have Jones PO, but my client had no idea at the time that the phone call was made to him of who the Joneses were until it was made known to him during that telephone call. But before then, Jones made absolutely no sense to him because he had never heard of the Joneses. All of the allegations regarding that telephone call, and as far as I can tell, the statements made by my client are, and I quote, as far as I know, everything in that house belongs to me. The second statement was, I don't know about anyone else's cabinets at my house. And he basically says he hasn't removed anything from, from key word, his house. It is undisputed that the cabinets that issued the next day were given back to the contractor. They were located in the trailer owned by my client at his house. He went and did an investigation after receiving the telephone call on June 30th. He went, even on the telephone call, he tells the investigator that he's going to review an email when he gets home. He does that. He now sees the email from his contractor notifying him that there could be some cabinets on his property that do not belong to him. He also called the cabinet subcontractor named Mr. Keith Fainu, who testified at the hearing on behalf of Mr. Hart. Now, coincidentally, my co-counsel, during his statement, did not mention any of the testimony by Mr. Fainu. It's kind of understandable in that it's not very good for Sled's case. Mr. Fainu testified that there was no way my client could have known that the Jones cabinets were in that house. In fact, he testified, Mr. Fainu, that he delivered hundreds of cabinets while being a contractor, and not even he noticed that the Jones cabinets were in that house. Boxes are not clearly marked. Mr. Fainu did not even tell my client about the Jones cabinets being located on the property until after the June 30th telephone call. Mr. Fainu testified that when the boxes were delivered, they were in disarray and in no type of sequence that my client could have noticed that Jones cabinets were in his home. There has been a lot of talk by my opposing counsel about how only the Jones cabinets were removed from the home at issue. What he didn't say was there were still Jones cabinets in the house the day that Mr. Jones came to get the cabinets that were in the trailer. So if my client was trying to have some type of ransom or get back at you type scheme, there were still Jones cabinets in the house. The reason that the cabinets were in the trailer was it was testified to by my client that he moved the cabinets so that the painters could paint them. The only reason those cabinets were in the trailer was because they were the cabinets that needed to be moved to make way for the painting. It was testified to that my client did not order the cabinets. He didn't know the colors of the cabinets because his wife ordered them. Mr. Fainu didn't tell him the colors of the cabinets. So basically what we have is we have a telephone call on June 3rd after my client has flown an aviation mission. He's in his car. He's being asked about an investigation and allegations without being able to conduct any type of research into the matter. Was he heated? Sure. Yeah, he's heated because his contractor, Mr. White, has done a terrible job of building his home and he's upset about it. 
Would he have been more polite? Sure. Do we take law enforcement credentials for that? No. The allegations in this case revolve around that telephone call on June 3rd. The opposing counsel wants to bring up a telephone call, I mean, a body cam video that happened the day after the telephone call on June 30th when the cabinets were returned to the contract. That, tele that body cam is 45 minutes in length, and not a single allegation that is being litigated in this case were contained in that video. All of the allegations of misconduct revolve around the June 30th recorded telephone call. That's why they were properly excluded. Now, he brings up the issue of impeachment. The hearing officer allowed the video to be used for impeachment. There was an opportunity for Adam, my opposing counsel, to play the excerpts that he wanted to play. He only played those. And the hearing officer ruled that those excerpts were relevant for the purposes of impeachment. What's not relevant is the whole 45 minute telephone call when there's no allegations of misconduct. I mean, excuse me, the 45 minute body cam video when there's not a single allegation of misconduct contained on that video. We believe the evidence is clear in this case. There was no intentional medical representation. Now, was the allegation, was the statement of, I haven't moved anything from my house, somewhat not correct? Well, maybe. The SLED investigator that testified, which was the only witness SLED put up for this case, when asked on cross-examination about the removed anything from the house issue, he agreed that if the cabinets were located in a trailer on Mr. Park's property with the house, that it could be as construed as his house. So the trailer, when Mr. Park says, I haven't moved anything from the house, he meant the property. Everything that has been delivered to the house is still on that property. Whether it's located in the house, trailer, wherever it may be, it's still at that address, that tax map. That's what he meant. That's what he testified to. SLED did not call a single witness to refute that. There was no one there to judge the credibility on behalf of the SLED officer. We have the investigator from Richland County of Mr. White, the only person who testified at the hearing was the SLED investigator. So the credibility issues have to go to my client and to his subcontractor who did testify under oath as to the intentionality of these statements. And the intentionality of it is the key. We believe that if you look at the timeline of this case and that the boxes were not conspicuous, it was impossible to tell what these boxes were and who they belonged to. And the fact that this telephone call with my client occurred in a car after an aviation mission while he's trying to get home. And then upon going home and learning of the email, calling his subcontractor, Mr. Pena, he went to further investigation, found the cabinets, and immediately called Mr. White to come get those cabinets. We believe, based on this timeline and these facts, that Mr. Park has not committed any intentional misconduct in this case. We believe that the hearing officer's decision should be upheld. Thank you, and I'll take any questions the panel may have. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Does the council have any questions of Mr. Riley? Chief Thomas. Thank you, Sheriff. I just want to ask the attorney, Mr. Park apparently took the cabinets and placed them in the trailer. The trailer belonged to Mr. Park, is that correct? That is correct. It was his trailer. And was the trailer locked with his lock, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Greg? Yes, Mr. Riley, just a quick question. Did he move all of the cabinets or just the ones with Jones on them? He moved the cabinets, and I'm going to answer this question as concisely as I can. He moved the cabinets that were in the way for his paint. Those were Jones cabinets, but there were still Jones cabinets inside his house. So he did not move 
all of the cabinets and just the John cabinets to his truck. There were still John cabinets inside the house. Are there any other questions from council? back here and seated next to me. Would he want to say anything? I'll, I'll ask. Chair, um, a question for Mr. Winston, please. Sure. Uh, Mr. Wildback and Prime Mr. Smith, would you please approach? And, uh, Council, have... um, Council, thank you. Do you uh, comment on the, uh, do, you, do you have any knowledge of when you all received the, uh, the report from the hearing officer, the recommendation from the hearing officer? Sure. Certainly, and, and, and I've got my notes from this conversation now. I never received the green cards myself. I, I actually very rarely ever know when anyone has pled signed for them. So what I did on this case was contact Investigator Brumlow to ask me the specific date that it was signed, and my note indicated, that he indicated to me that it was signed on June the 1st. And that's the date that I used in calendar and our response deadline off of was the date that I got from Investigator Brumlow on that. So that's that's how I calculated the time was based on the information I had received from Investigator Brumlow who looked at the card. So I, I did not actually ever see it. But that's, that's how I calculated our, our, our due date and our deadline was based on the date that he provided. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, council members. I do appreciate the, the time and the ability to speak. Um, I, I don't know what else I can really say that could, you know, clear anything up any more than has been said through the entire process of this. Um, this is a grave thing that's happened to me. Um, I do not discount the seriousness of law enforcement and law enforcement officers being truthful uh, as I have always been in a law enforcement capacity as well as a National Guard member capacity for the past 26 years as well as any capacity in my life as my wife or whatever. Can things be misunderstood? Certainly. Did I have an issue with a builder at the time that cost me? Certainly. Um, I definitely was was heated. Um, we. This was an on, before I got a phone call from the investigator with Richland County, this had been an ongoing problem for weeks. This is not, this was not just day one of a problem. And when that was brought up in the context and in the way it was to me at that time, it was definitely something that caught me off guard and put me on my heels to where I felt I needed to kind of defend myself. Uh, I did not intentionally tell a, a lie. I didn't tell somebody something. I wasn't trying to mislead anybody. These cabinets, they were in there. They were dropped off at the house. They were dropped off at the house several weeks, almost two months prior to, due to the builder wanting to get rid of everything that he had in his possession that belonged to him. And in his haste, from what I've understood talking to Mr. Fano, who was the subcontractor for the installation of the cabinets, that these other clients' cabinets were dropped off at the house. Now they were just, at, at the time that they were moved, they were neatly stacked in the way and I needed to move them. But the house, is a, it was a construction site trying to get painting done, trying to get cabinets in, trying to speed up delays that had been made. So this was a very emotional time all the way around. This is two years into the project. It was only supposed to be 10 months. Therefore, I was very emotional about it. Uh, I did not understand, even though when 
the, the investigator said there was an email. He sent me an email about it. I went back and looked at the email. I tried to figure out what was going on. And, did, and I was having a meeting with him to figure things out, but it was to figure out the rest of the bill. <coughs> Excuse me. To see how we could move forward and get this project completed so we would have a place to live due to the fact that we were selling our other home. So there were a lot of things that were going through my mind and a lot of things I wanted to get straightened out. There was, there was no ransom, no, I mean, not one time has anyone said, or did I ever say, if you don't give me this, I'm not gonna give you that. After it was came to light, this property was given back the next day. As I told the deputy, the escort deputy that day on scene, through the body camera footage through, that there was a, a miscommunication, misunderstanding. And once I figured that out through Mr. Fano, we then immediately, the gentleman had his property back. So he was notified of the mistake in law enforcement's presence that day. And at, at that point, I thought it was done until I got the notice of the our investigation. But there has never been a time that I, you know, my credibility that has been impugned like this and my integrity. And that's one thing I pride myself on. And this has been a very unsettling thing for me to now have to essentially prove that I'm not this. And, and I honestly hope that through this and the recommendation of the hearing officer, we can, I can get past this and move on. Recommendation must do so within 15 working days of receipt. 
I think that's probably the key here is the green card shows that the um, that the party I hear in this case Lynn received it on the 1st of June and the way you count this come on but according to the rule is it the first working day at that point would be the second which means the 15th working day of the month or the, within the, that time period would have been the 22nd date that it's my understanding that Mr. Whitman filed his motion so it's it's uh it's working days, not calendar days. Yes, sir. That's that's why this gets it's sticky at times because you have to take into account holidays and everything else. But in this case, there were no holidays between. It's purely a working day issue here. And if I may say this to your edification is. Let's never file an appeal. And this is not an appeal where they were appealing the hearing officer's recommendation. This was just part of a process. And so the uh, the appeal, if you will, is automatic to the hearing officer's recommendation. It must come to the training council by statute and by regulation. Uh, so this technically wasn't an appeal that was filed, it was a motion. But the motion still feels that council will make this determination that it fell within a 2320-150 E. Judge Stern, does, uh, does that answer your question? And, uh, it does, and Jimmy, is this council or is this the chair that makes the decision on this? Uh, sir, someone would have to make a motion on whether to um, sustain or deny the motion that Mr. Riley put forward after the chair puts that to council. Okay, uh, before we do that, Director uh, Boyles, did I see your hand waving? Yes, sir, Sheriff. I was going to ask if, if you wanted a motion to affirm that uh, um, I'm going to get back with you. This, this, that we are denying Mr. Hart's motion that this is out of order. Is that, Jimmy, did I say that for Okay. So, Sheriff, what I'm suggesting, what I'm, I'm wanting to affirm for the record is that um, the council um, heard um, uh, Mr. Hart's um, appeal, uh, and yet we still find that, um, that this is right for council to consider and discuss from the chair i ruled that a uh, a motion would be in order if that is your motion uh, go ahead sir yes sir i would make that in the motion please don't ask me to restate it i'll second that motion I know. the motion as i as i understand it is that the uh, receipt of certified letter and the response was within the time frame of the statute governing such. Yes, sir, Sheriff, much more eloquently than I could have put it. Yes, sir. That's about as lawyer esque as I could be. <laughs> uh, so we have a motion uh, by Director Balls and a second by Director Sterling. Do we have any discussion of that? Being no discussion, I'll call for the question. Sheriff Foster? Aye. Director Sturkey? Aye. Director Boyle? Aye. Director Wood? Aye. Sheriff Dale? Aye. Uh, Chief Thomas? Aye. 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 Motion does carry. Now, uh, thank you, Director Sterling, for keeping me on the straight and narrow path. And at this point, I'll entertain a motion as to uh, what we have on the table now.
have a motion, I guess the it fails for a Do we need a motion to discuss at least? I think that, and again, I'm not an attorney nor an expert in parliamentary procedure, but what I understand of it is that you do need a motion to discuss further um, the issue. Otherwise, the, the point stands as is. That's my understanding, Mr. Fennell. And now, can you help me? Yes, sir. In order for this to proceed forward, we need council to make a motion um, whether to adopt or not the hearing officer's recommendation in order to get it out for discussion. Director Walls. I thank you, Sheriff. For the purposes of discussion, I'll make the motion that we adopt the hearing officer's recommendation or report. Motion is that we adopt the hearing officer report with the no finding on board, right? Correct. Right. Second. I'll second. Any other second? Uh, Captain Gallo. Now we'll open the we'll open the floor for discussion. Brian, um, I'm conflicted on this one. This is a tough one. Here, question. Right, well, for, for, for counsel, I'm not sure who. Maybe for Mr. Whitsitt. Mr. Whitney, could you could you go over for me one more time, please? That the allegations here are for willful and intentional deception. Can you walk me through the uh, can you walk me through please the uh, the conversation with Richmond County Sheriff? Uh, and also the, the timing of the conversation with the sheriff's deputy in Richmond County and, and also the sled internal investigator, please. Certainly, I, I need to get my, let me grab another note on the timeline of the statement to the investigator. I, I need that date. Telephone call happened on June the 30th. That's when the conversation um, between Sergeant Loretta and Mr. Hart took place was on June the 30th. Subsequently, uh, Mr. Hart met with SLED investigators. So then would have been the next day to July the 1st when another Richland County officer went out to the property and Mr. Hart's cabinets, two cabinets were returned by Mr. White and the Jones cabinets were removed 
from the trailer was that following day, July the 1st. And on July the 29th was the date of the SLED um, interview, SLED's internal interview with Mr. Harp, and then he submitted a written statement on Monday, August the 9th. This is the specific time frame. Thank you, Mr. Whitsitt. Um, can you help me understand the, um, the nexus between uh, the connection between the Richland County Sheriff's investigation and the SLED internal investigation? Certainly, uh, Richland County ultimately was the complainant that generated the SLED investigation. That was established in the record. And so the Richland County criminal investigation ultimately did not result in any law enforcement action in time but that was the genesis of the complaint to SLED alleging misconduct on Mr. Hart's behalf was the, the allegation of intentional deception during uh, the phone call that occurred. And ultimately, I, I walked through that. I'm happy to walk through it again. I mean, it, it, it centers on whether there was honesty and, and whether he was as candid in his conversation with Sergeant Barita indicating I haven't taken anything from my house, which I believe we know to be false. And we know to be, I submit, intentionally deceptive given the mind state, given the backstory that we had involved here. Thank you, Mr. Whitson. Thank you. Mr. Whitson, uh, from, from the chair, um, could you clarify when SLED did, SLED did an internal investigation? And did he basically stick to that same story or did he offer the, the truthfulness in the, in your internal investigation? Certainly. During the internal, he did indicate um, that it was a mistake and that they were returned the next day. That's where that that version came from. And then I also read sort of his statement of mindset and intent on all of this. But his statement to SLED investigators was that this was a mistake and that, that went from there. Uh, I have a quick question, Mr. Chair. Uh, please. So, um, in the recommendation, it talks about uh, Mr. White went to the home and tried to locate the Jones cabinets and could not locate the Jones cabinets. I'm not sure this question, I think it's a question from Mr. Hart's attorney, Mr. Hart. If there were some cabinets that said Jones on them that were removed and some cabinets that said Jones on them that were not removed, how come he didn't find some a portion of the order, I guess, is the best way to ask it. Um, that's what Mr. White said was that no cabinets belonging to Mr. Jones could be located in the house. But you stated that some of those Jones cabinets were still in the house. It appears from this that all of the Jones cabinets were removed. Well, you know, that, that's a good question. That's a question that should have been asked of Mr. White at the hearing, but he was not called as a witness. So it was impossible to judge his credibility. For all we know, Mr. White was lying. For all we know, he didn't look good enough. I would have loved to have asked him that question on cross-examination, but I didn't get the opportunity because he didn't appear. The witnesses that did appear, my client and the subcontractor said it was a mistake. The sled investigator that did appear. If you look at the hearing officer's finding, I went through every allegation on cross-examination. The allegation is being page four of State's Exhibit 1. They are excerpts from the telephone call on June 30th. The hearing officer's decision walks through the cross-examination of the sled investigator, and in every single one of them, he admitted this could have been a mistake. That is telling. The only witness for SLED basically admits what my client alleged. We would have loved to hear from Mr. White. I don't know why he thought that there were no John Cabot still left in that house. But my client, who was there, who did testify on the road, was adamant 
There was John's cabin still in the house and John cabin still in the truck. There is, there is seemingly no dispute that only John's cabin were moved to the trailer. My client provided an explanation for why. From the video, I don't recall, I just recall stuff being moved in the trailer. I don't recall it being moved. I don't know if it was let in, not let in, so I don't know if this can come in or not. Um, I only recall, other council members can help me out here, the cabinets being moved from the trailer, not from the home. I don't believe that was on the video yes, at all. I, I think the only, from my understanding, the record is clear. The only cabinets at issue, the cabinets in the home and cabinets on, in the trailer, still located at the home. There was no allegation that cabinets had been completely removed from that property. Right. If I understand your question correctly. Well, the question was, and I'm not sure if it's on the video or not, I can't recall right now, but I'm wondering if anybody else in the council can recall. But all I remember is the trailer being open. I don't remember anybody going in the house to retrieve other Jones cabinets. There were some cabinets taken off of the back of Mr. White's truck and taken into the home, but I don't believe the video showed any being removed from the home. I don't believe that's on the video. And I don't know if in the video, whole video was admitted, but I don't know if the video contained the entire interaction of when those where cabinets came from and, and removed them. It could have been done prior to the video starting. Okay, thank you. I have no more questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Any other discussion? Thank you, thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you to the Training Council. Uh, my name is Gerald Dees. Uh, I'm Sumter County Bar. I represent the respondent and the officer, Mr. Deron Solomon. This is uh, stemming from a hearing that, a uh, contested hearing that occurred on March the 9th of 2022. Uh, on behalf of my client, Mr. Solomon, I, I am respectfully requesting that the Council overturned the hearing officer's recommendation to rescind 
Mr. Solomon's law enforcement certification based on the conclusion reached by the hearing officer that Mr. Solomon engaged in this conduct by intentionally making a false statement to, to, a, law, to a law enforcement officer during a, during a police investigation. Um, and to the members of council, I would indicate on behalf of my client that his position has been and still is that um, there, there was no intentional misstatement, there was no intentional deceit uh, based on the statement that he made to the Sumter Police Department officer that responded to his home on July the 25th of 2021 um, due to a, a, a domestic, a call about a domestic disturbance between Mr. Solomon and his then significant other. Uh, essentially what this case boils down to is that uh, it is alleged that when the investigating officer, the officer with the Sumter Police Department asked Mr. Solomon if he had reported this incident to his SLED supervisor, uh, Mr. Solomon, his response to that question was that he had reported it um, and that essentially um, there was no, basically that he had already reported it to his SLED supervisor. Um, in fact, it wasn't until the very next morning on July 26th of 2021 that Mr. Solomon reported uh, this uh, incident to his SLED supervisor. Um, it's our contention that uh, essentially when Mr. Solomon was asked if he had reported it to his supervisor when he said yes, um, and this was testified to by Mr. Solomon at the time of the contested hearing, when he said yes, he had reported it, he was, refer he was referring to his uh, supervisor with the Sumter County Sheriff's Department who was in his line of supervision um, when he was with the Sumter County Sheriff's Department because he, at the time the question was asked by the uh, Sumter, police, Sumter police officer that was there at the scene, when that officer asked Mr. Solomon that question, Mr. Solomon had already contacted um, his uh, supervisor who was in his line of supervision with the Sumter County Sheriff's Department and told him about this incident this domestic disturbance incident. Um, regardless of, of whether you believe uh, Mr. Solomon's statement to the Sumter police officer was intentionally deceitful or misleading, um, ultimately our position is uh, he, he didn't, he wasn't, the statement he made, whether it's a lie or not, it did not in any way benefit Mr. Solomon. It didn't, there wasn't a detriment to the investigation. Um, it could have just simply been a situation where he misspoke um, because he was, he did call a supervisor. It was just his, his Sumter County Sheriff's Department supervisor, uh, Major Kofi. Um, but the very next morning he did contact his sled supervisor. So again, with, with regards to the recommendation of the hearing officer to rescind his law enforcement certification as our position that the statement made by Mr. Solomon um, was essentially, uh, uh, he misspoke. It was, it was a harmless misstatement, if anything, um, and should not result in the termination of his law enforcement certification. His statement did not in any way compromise the investigation. Um, it didn't it wasn't a detriment to the investigation. It was no benefit to him. Um, I know that um, one of the conclusions reached by the hearing officer was that um, when Mr. Solomon was questioned about this situation um, by SLED, he indicated that the reason why he initially told the responding officer that he had already contacted his SLED supervisor, even though he really hadn't at that point, because he wanted to be the first person to report it to his sled supervisor. And that, that may be uh, exactly what his mindset was at the time he was asked that, um, that he did want to be the first person to report it to his sled supervisor. Um, and in fact, he was, I believe, the first person to report it to his sled supervisor the very next morning. So it wasn't a situation where he told the responding officer um, that he had already reported this incident to his SLED supervisor and then it was days or weeks later before SLED heard about this or they had to hear about it from the Sumter Police Department. Mr. Solomon reported this incident um, the very next 
um, the very next morning. And ultimately, you know, it's a, our position is, is that in this situation, um, the, the statement he made essentially in no way compromised the investigation and in no way benefited Mr. Solomon. It, it was, it, it, there was no detriment, there was no harm caused by his statement. So it's, you know, it's our position that the, the, the consequences of this should be commensurate with the transgression. Um, for him to, and I certainly understand the importance of law, enforce, law enforcement officers maintaining their integrity, being honest and straightforward and truthful, the entire, um, our entire legal system and judicial system hinges on it, and that, I certainly understand that. But in this situation, um, Mr. Solomon's statement to the responding officer that he had already contacted his supervisor, because the question actually was, have you contacted your supervisor? The question wasn't, have you contacted your supervisor with SLED? He, the question from the officer was, have you contacted your supervisor? And when Mr. Uh, Solomon responded, yes, in fact, that's accurate because he had previously, before the officer arrived, contacted his supervisor with the, the South County Sheriff's Department. Um, Mr. Solomon had a long tenured, a relatively long tenured career with the South County Sheriff's Department from 2013 to, to 2020. And the officer, the, the, uh, the supervisor, his former supervisor that he did contact prior to law enforcement arriving at the scene, um, Terrence Copley was contacted by Mr. South. Now the question might be raised, well, why was this not, um, why, did, why did Mr. Solomon not tell SLED investigators about his communication with Mr. Copley uh, when he was initially questioned? And what he indicates is he just did, he thought he was being investigated primarily because of domestic disturbance. He didn't really see, he didn't, he did not see the relevance of the fact that he had contacted Terrence Copley. Um, and that is why um, his former supervisor, Mr. Copley, was not called as a witness at, at the time of the hearing, because quite frankly, I was not even aware myself until the day of the hearing that Mr. Solomon had contacted his uh, his previous supervisor of the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department the day of the incident prior to the police arriving. So again, did he contact a supervisor prior to police arri arriving? Yes. When the officer asked him if he contacted a, his supervisor and Mr. Solomon stated yes he did, well he had. Did he contact his sled supervisor the very next morning? Yes he did. So. The real, I guess, issue is, was he intentionally lying and being deceitful and misleading when he was asked by the, super, by the responding officer, Had you, have you contacted your supervisor? And he said yes. My opposition is he was not trying to be intentionally misleading or deceitful or, 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 or attempting to evade the truth. Because in reality, he had contacted his supervisor, which was Terrence Copley. Um, since the hearing, um, Mr. Copley has provided a statement by way of a letter where he confirms um, that Mr. Solomon did contact him on the night of the incident prior to police arriving. I have that, uh, that letter. I would like to submit that letter for consideration by counsel if that's appropriate. Um, and I also have, ultimate, also have a letter from the Sumter County Sheriff, Anthony Ennis, who, uh, who wrote us a letter in support of Mr. Solomon. I would like to submit that to the council for consideration as well, if that's appropriate. Um, ultimately, as I said, I, I believe it's well understood that it's imperative that law enforcement officers um, are truthful, that they're honest, that they operate with the highest integrity. Uh, no one makes light of that requirement. And, and, and that uh, and that is essentially uh, unequivocal. It, it can't be compromised or shouldn't be com compromised. But the reality is, and the truth is, through body cam footage and other surveillance um, methods, we know that there are times when officers don't tell the truth. They don't um, always conduct themselves in, in, with, with high integrity or character. We see it um, all the time. So the question is, when is it 
Um, is it a, is it a hundred percent of the time that, that when an officer doesn't tell the truth that he is subject he is subject to losing his law enforcement certification? Is that the absolute one hundred percent result, or are there circumstances where the totality of the situation must be considered? Um, and I believe this is a situation where the council should look at the totality of the situation, look at uh, whether or not. Mr. Solomon was looking to compromise the investigation involving the domestic disturbance issue. Was he trying to somehow gain some benefit for himself? Was he trying to uh, intentionally mislead the officer in, in such a way that it would, it would jeopardize this investigation? Or, or did he just simply say yes because he knew moments before law enforcement arrived, he had contacted Terrence Copley who was in his line of supervision with the Sheriff's Department. And did he also understand the importance of letting his sled supervisor know about this incident? Of course, because the very next morning, he did report it to his sled supervisor. So I believe this is a situation where, where I'm asking the council to take a look at the totality of the situation, look at the circumstances surrounding it, and not just the, not just the cut and dry question of whether or not he misspoke when he was asked if he had looked, notified his supervisor. If every officer is held to that standard where they can't misspeak or they can't uh, say something that's untrue, and every time they do, if it's after if it's proven that it's not true, they are deemed to be unworthy of their law enforcement certification um, without individuals looking at the totality of the circumstances and also looking at what harm was done, what, 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 what type of detriment was, uh, was, was caused to the investigation, not looking at all those relevant factors. If, if every time an officer misspeaks or even says something that's not true, if that automatically means their law enforcement certification should be rescinded, um, then I believe um, we're gonna have some difficulty when it comes to uh, basically having some level of, of uh, of, of, I guess some type of remedy for officers when they might find themselves in this situation. Um, or there has to be some way an officer who may have misspoke or told something or said something that, that's not true, even if that's been established, if it's, if it's also shown that this was not intentional, it wasn't, it wasn't an, there was no ill will or ill intent, um, and essentially it was a harmless statement that didn't cause any harm or detriment, an officer in that situation should have an opportunity to, to, get, to be given a second chance, to have another have an opportunity to prove themselves to be worthy of that law enforcement certification, as opposed to every time an officer says an untruth, that automatically results in the, in the, in the termination of their, um, in the, in, in their certification being rescinded. Thank you. Mr. Dean, stand by just one minute. Uh, I got a question for the attorney, Mr. Fennell. Would the presentation of his documentation at this venue be appropriate, or can we not take that? Sure. Regulation 37107 talks of final agency decision, and subsection D states the council shall issue a final agency decision based on the evidence accepted during the contested case hearing and the applicable statutes and regulations. There is no mechanism to take evidence in after the hearing is closed. All right, thank you. Um, does council have any questions of Mr. Deese? Uh, Captain Gatton? Mr. Deese, when was uh, Mr. Solomon's start date with SLED? His, uh, Council's indulgence for just a moment. I believe he said somewhere in 2020. That is correct. He ended his career with the Sumter County Sheriff's Department. I'm sorry, start date was SLED was August the 17th of 2020. I apologize. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Dean. Yes, uh, Mr. Whitman, uh, you represent SLED on this matter. Uh, do you have anything you wish to say, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the Training Council. Again, my name is Adam Whitsett, General Counsel of SLED. Here, asking that the Council uphold and affirm the hearing officer's recommendation in this matter. The substantial evidence submitted and established I believe fairly clearly and unequivocally that Mr. Solomon committed misconduct when he intentionally lied and provided false information to a Sumter police officer during the course of an official law enforcement investigation. And I will agree, intent is the key here. And I will touch on to the links that we went to flesh out the intent here because everybody realized that the issue the standard has never been simply misspeaking. The standard has never been simply being wrong. The standard is, did you intentionally provide false, misleading, or deceptive testimony? And I believe the substantial evidence clearly demonstrated the answer to that question was yes. As noted, there's no real dispute in the underlying facts of the case. This all started as a domestic, the, the uh, Sumter Police Department ultimately responded to this domestic, and the issue arose because of a specific false statement. It actually was two parts here. And interestingly, it actually came up. So during the course of this investigation, Mr. Solomon made a statement to the law enforcement officer that sort of piqued his, his I think that sort of signified that he had some law enforcement background or some law enforcement training. He said something along the lines of, hey, we need to go inside or separate the two witnesses. There was a statement that sort of jogged that. So they, they went inside the house to ultimately get Mr. Solomon's statement while the other witness and other officer stayed outside to take the statement. And in the course of this conversation with the Sumter police officer, the question was, who do you work for? That was the question that was, that was asked. And in response, Mr. Solomon gave a two sentence answer. Oh, SLED, I was with Sumter County. I already called my supervisor and let them know what was going on. And he was like, well, we'll deal with that tomorrow. I'll concede this wasn't some sort of gotcha question. This was, this was simply a, a follow up question that the officer had because of the statement that had been previously made. But there's no dispute that he had not contacted his SLED supervisor, that this was in fact false, which is interesting because it was two parts. Contacted him, and then he relayed a completely fictitious part of this. Oh, he said we deal with this tomorrow. So the hearing officer correctly noted that this was a false and incorrect statement, and this was misleading. Now we established at the hearing several times what the intent was. And the intent was, was a paramount issue for SLED's internal investigation. So the question was specifically asked. And the answer was, it's on page four of State's Exhibit 1, that his intent was to, quote, imply that the Sumter Police Department, that he was going to inform his supervisor so that Sumter Police Department wouldn't call first. At the hearing, it was established that he wanted to notify SLED before the Sumter Police Department did. That's the issue, and that's the intent. It was acknowledged that his intent in making the false statement to the Sumter Police Officer was a, so he would have the opportunity to contact his supervisor and present this information to his current employer first. Did not want his employer contacted by another law enforcement agency to inform them that there was a, a domestic incident or any of that going on. That's the benefit that he got, and that was established by substantial evidence at the hearing. There was really, that was the crux of the issue. That was exactly what our investigation ultimately honed in on, because ultimately we know that the, the charges didn't go anywhere. But the question came up, why did you tell him you'd already contacted your supervisor, and why did you provide this information that he told you we'd deal with it tomorrow? And his answer was, to SLED, I wanted to imply to Sumter that I was going to inform them so they wouldn't call first, 
And at the hearing, he wanted, he said that he wanted to notify SLED before the Sumter Police Department did. This is the intent component that makes this misconduct. This wasn't a simple mistake. Again, we're not held to that standard. Law enforcement officers aren't held to never making a misspeak or never saying something that proves incorrect. But what the, the, the rules and the regulations prohibit is intentionally providing false and misleading information. And this was confirmed unequivocally by these statements to both the SLED investigator that was made part of the record and to the, the, the evidence and the testimony at the hearing. I do want to touch on this, this notion, again, this became the central issue in the SLED investigation. So Mr. Solomon was given multiple opportunities to explain the statement. Never once at any point prior to the hearing was this, I was talking about someone else defense raised. Again, there were three different conversations by SLED's investigators, two of which centered specifically on this one statement. So I submit he had every opportunity to acknowledge, hey, I misspoke, but he simply did not. In fact, he acknowledged my intent was to imply that I already had so they would not contact SLED first so that I could ultimately contact SLED first. I believe that the hearing officer correctly noted and simply acknowledged this wasn't a simple mistake or a misspeak. In Mr. Solomon's own words, he intentionally wanted to imply that something that he said was true, knowing in fact it was not true, so that he could contact SLED and he could get out in front of this with his own supervisors there. This wasn't a mistake. He had every opportunity, and unfortunately, this statement that was sort of not the central focus of the underlying criminal investigation ultimately was intentional misconduct, and it was a false statement made in the course of a law enforcement investigation with the intent to deceive the officer to whom it was spoken. I submit, members of the council, that is misconduct in South Carolina, and I ask that you uphold and affirm the hearing officer in the entirety. Thank you. Any questions from council on this committee? Thank you. Mr. Deese, I failed to ask, is your client present? Yes, sir, your honor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, chairman. Would he like to make a statement? Let me confer with him just briefly. Sir, he's elected to give a statement. Good morning, council. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning, Sheriff Austin and council. Over the past year, it has been an embarrassment towards the community, towards my family, especially towards my children. Within my law enforcement career, I've never been in a situation like this to this capacity. I've always, I was a crime scene investigator. I've always upheld the law. I was always honest, always collected evidence, testified in court under oath, under honesty, and I was always that type of man. I was always a man first before a law enforcement officer, but it's just an unfortunate circumstance that I was, I placed myself in, and I take full responsibility for my actions, and I plead to you today to don't revoke my certification. Law enforcement has been, it's been something I've always wanted to do ever since I was a little boy, to have that opportunity to be an officer and help out the community and still help out the community to this day, even though I'm in, I haven't been in law enforcement this last year. It has been, it's been a high opener, and I just hope you find it to give me a second chance, and I really thank you for your time and your patience with me. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Solomon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council? Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
If not, uh, we'll uh, entertain, pardon me, entertain the motion. We have a motion to permanently deny certification based on the hearing officer. Second by Air Fail. Any discussion at this time? Seeing no discussion, I'll call for the question. Uh, roll call vote. I've been a lawyer for 34 years in Georgetown County, and I'm here representing the best of the best. Um, Mr. Barley's uh, law enforcement career has been just under three years, but if you look at all his reviews, he had met or exceeded all expectations. He um, has the respect of his peers in the law enforcement community, and he had um, two of the officers that he worked with um, come testify about that he always respected and always treated the public with the ultimate respect. At some point, he is in a situation where he is with me, hit me that, please. He's out in the middle of the night and uh, he gets with a, a, a big fella, and, and this is exhibit number five. Um, and my client, I want to say, me, he's a big fella, but this guy outweighs my client by 120 pounds. And he got in a tussle with him on the ground. And at this point, and I also point you to exhibit five, um, which, excuse me, the exhibit uh, four, which is this gentleman's arrest record where he has six DUIs. He's got a pointing and presenting a firearm. He's got a half dozen assault and batteries where he knew he was dealing with a tough guy and that at some point he had him down, he had to put the handcuffs on him because he was afraid. He had told the person, look, stand at the back of the truck um, for our own safety. And he had to go about what he was doing because he had another arrest he was doing at the time. And this gentleman, with unfortunately with the training officer standing there looking for him, goes back and steps in his vehicle. You can see it on the video, but he slips something into his left pocket. At this point, my guy decides, I gotta take control of this. I don't know what he has. I know I'm dealing with that bad guy. So he, he says, look, I'm just gonna put the handcuffs on you so we straighten all this out. And this guy wasn't going for it. He takes him to the ground. And again, my guy is a big guy, but he's outweighed by more than 100 pounds. And as he's on his back and he's struggling to get his hands on William, this guy is so strong, um, this, this Ronnie Todd, he came up on all fours and he was getting ready to roll my guy underneath him. And that's when my guy had to take other action to drop him back down, get the handcuffs on him. And when as soon as he did it, my guy stops and says, man, why, why do we have to get into all that? Let me help you up. And he's completely respectful, like he'd been for all the situations. He testified that all the way from high school on, 
He'd never been in a fist fight before, never had to strike somebody with a closed hand in his entire life. But this time when he was in fear for himself and the training officer, he did strike him quickly, just enough to subdue him so he'd come back off his fours and he could get the handcuffs on him. The recommendation of the hearing officer, and I, I will tell you that the hearing officer, Tim Plunkett, and, and I've been a lawyer for 34 years, if you read that opinion, that opinion looks at the law and it completely um, explains the law that there was no physical or psychological abuses whatsoever in this case. Nothing was done when they were trying to, to harm the individual or to demean him. All he was doing was taking control back. And it was unfortunate it had to go that far, but it did. Um, but we ask that you take the um, well-written opinion of the hearing officer, uh, Tim Pluckett, where he, he believes that there was no finding of physical or psychological abuses and affirm that opinion. Um, I'll leave you with this one last thought, and it's not part of this record here, so the court can, can uh, choose to uh, ignore it, but my client knew that he was dealing with this person with this incredible record that had, he was, a, he was somebody who had presented firearms, he's somebody that had, um, had assault batteries, had all these multiple uh, DUIs, and I'll leave you with the, with the final part, um, and some of your older people on the, on the uh, council may remember uh, Paul Harvey. Remember Paul Harvey and the rest of the story? You don't have to take this person, you know, nowadays with the advent of the internet. If you don't have to go to NCI to look at this, but type in this man's name, Ronnie Todd, in Georgetown County, and you'll see why he's sitting now subsequent to this event, but not only a month later, that he's, he's sitting in jail, now charged with a double felony uh, murder. These were, this is tough guys out here, and my guy is the best of the best. He was never abusing anybody. He was only doing what was absolutely the minimum he needed to get control of the situation to protect himself and the other officers. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions for counsel? Any questions for Attorney Duncan? Thank you, Mr. Duncan. And Mr. Bowery here, if anybody wants to ask him a question, he's here and he understands how serious this is and and uh, happy to answer any questions that the uh, have to say anything. Thank you. I'm going to take a motion. I got a motion to accept here and officer recommendation and explain the record to have a second. Got a second. Is there any further discussion? Any further discussion? Roll we'll call vote. Keith Field. Aye. Chair Foster. Aye.
Anybody have any questions of Mr. McDuffie? Any member of council have any questions of Mr. McDuffie? Okay, thank you, Mr. McDuffie. Thank you. That's right. We'll be happy to hear from you. Good morning, um, members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you in this matter. Um, it's an unfortunate case here with Ms. McDuffie. He just uh, came forward and admitted um, uh, what he did that, that did in fact constitute um, misconduct. Essentially, to, to get to the, the root here of, of what happened, um, uh, there was a a news article or a, a, a news um, cast that was done, I think by WYS, that um, was broadcast back in December of last year, 2021, regarding some officers and other, hired by other agencies who had um, gotten in trouble for um, fast forwarding their training videos that um, the Academy uh, puts up on their website. And um, that's what happened in this case, essentially. Um, Ms. McDuffie, he, he admitted in the investigation and, and really during the, the hearing officer's um, uh, hearing that, that he did fast forward uh, the training videos. Um, and our investigator, Mr. Melvin Warren, is, is here as well as um, uh, Mr. Chad Gambrell, who is our, our, our deputy director of, of offender offender services, offender um, services for field um, that supervises all the agents throughout the state. Um, when Mr. Gambrell became aware of this particular situation occurring, he sent out an email uh, warning all, all of the agents across the state that, um, that if they were caught doing this, that they would be terminated. Again, that was sent out in December of 2021. Um, after that time, um, there was also um, a, a notice put up in our, the agency's APATIS software, training software, um, warning, um, warning in agents that, that they had to review uh, the academy training videos in full. Um, there was proof provided at the initial hearing that Mr. McDuffie did sign off on that, checking that he did in fact um, view that warning as well as the fact that Mr. Gambrell's email was sent out in December of 2021 warning people um, that if they did that, did that, they would in fact be terminated. And that is unfortunately what happened in this particular matter. Um, on behalf of the department, we would ask that, um, that this council uphold the hearing officer's recommendation um, because we, we believe that there is, there was evidence and there is evidence in this case, um, high preponderance of evidence to show that misconduct did in fact occur. Um, the training video, I believe, was except for the video three, two to three hour video and, and um, through the evidence provided through the academy, uh, Mr. McDuffie only reviewed about approximately 28 minutes of that. So, I'll just, with that said, I will um, close my discussion right now unless uh, members of the council have any questions. Again, I do want to mention that um, Mr. Melvin Warren, our OPR internal investigator, is, who did the investigation on this matter, he's present if you have questions of him. And our deputy director, Mr. Gambrell, is also um, present if you have questions of him as well. Any member of council have any questions for Ms. Wright or either Mr. Gambrell, the uh, OPR or internal affairs investigator? Any member of council have any questions? Chair Foster? Uh, just one question, Chief. Was the video, the training video, that was the Cavus video, and uh, was it before or after? the uh, warning was placed on all the videos? Um, the the CADIS um, 
video, I believe the cadence is actually a, a program that um, Triple P owns, right? Um, okay, I'm gonna let Mr. Melvin Warren, the OPR investigator, he's standing here, he's gonna answer your question. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, it was in a cadence video, Domestic Violence by the Academy, by the Western Justice Academy, and it occurred after Director Swindler sent out his notice to all agencies to um, so we can be considered training misconduct if somebody fast forward to this video. Thank you, sir. Any other questions, Mr. Warren? Mr. Bright, Ms. Gambrill? Any other questions? I'm eight five. Mr. Bright, Mr. Warren, thank you. Thank you. Mr. McDuffie, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, yes, sir. Um, like I said, I did go back to, to view the domestic violence training in the cadence, and I, and I can attest that there was no um, statement of education on that training, but the trainings after that, there was a statement um, of education on each training after that one. Okay. Anybody have any questions, Mr. McDonough? I move to accept the hearing officer's report and uh, permanent denial of eligibility. Got a motion to accept the hearing officer's recommendation and permanent denial of eligibility for certification. Do I have a second? Second. I got a second. Is there any further discussion? Is there any further discussion? Any other questions of counsel or Mr. McDuffie? Here's our roll call vote. No. Sheriff Alter. Aye. Director Sterling. Aye. Director Boyle. Aye. Wait till 